Molt bona tarda a tots i molt benvinguts i moltes gràcies per la vostra presència en aquesta tercera i darrera sessió del cicle Objectes perduts. Bé, amb nosaltres tenim avui a un col·lega que ens honora la seva presència. Alguns de vosaltres l'heu llegit i l'heu gaudit és en Sam Alberti, és un tros d'historiador, un historiador de... és un historiador de la ciència, un historiador de la medicina, però també és un historiador de moltes altres coses. De fet, la seva formació és com a historiador i la seva carrera professional l'ha desenvolupat fonamentalment gràcies a aquesta activitat en la que s'ha format, és a dir, en la història. Això és absolutament fonamental per a entendre el seu devenir professional. Ell, fonamentalment, gràcies a aquesta trajectòria, a aquest background en història, s'ha desenvolupat professionalment com a curator, com a professional del món dels museus. Va treballar inicialment durant un temps a Manchester, al Manchester Museum, un temps després va anar a parar a Londres. A Londres ha estat durant uns quants anys el director del Royal College of Surgeons de Londres, del Hunterian Museum, entre d'altres col·leccions museològiques que tenen allà. I des de fa uns pocs mesos ha decidit canviar totalment d'aires i deixar Londres per una ciutat més petita, però que té una força i una empenta des d'un vista cultural brutal, com és Edimburg. I Edimburg ha estat contractat com a keeper de les col·leccions de ciència i tecnologia del conglomerat aquest del National Museums of Scotland. Bé... El que m'interessaria destacar del Sam Alberti, ara, abans que faci ell la presentació, és algunes coses que jo crec que ens interessen com a historiador. Si us heu fixat una mica en la llista aquesta de publicacions que vam seleccionar, el Sam Alberti no s'ha centrat única i exclusivament en la seva mirada històrica, en una ciutat, en el centre del món, del centre del coneixement, de la producció de coneixement científic, que seria Londres, sinó que les seves mirades han estat prou àmplies, prou esteses per la geografia britànica. Ha treballat a Sheffield, ha treballat les col·leccions de Manchester, les col·leccions de Glasgow, fins i tot les de Dublín, i això és una cosa molt interessant, perquè aquest caràcter no londoncèntric, d'alguna manera, l'honora, perquè sovint el problema que tenen els historiadors és aquest caràcter de centralitat que acaben prenent les seves recerques. Centralitat vull dir geogràfica, oblidant el territori. Bé, aquesta és una qüestió que jo crec que és interessant. Una altra que a mi també m'ha semblat sempre molt interessant dels seus treballs és que no només fa història de la medicina o història de la ciència. En els seus llibres també trobes altres formulacions que van més enllà. Per exemple, trobes història de l'economia. I quan ell estudia les col·leccions científiques, el el pes que tenen l'adquisició, les, com es diu, això, les subhastes, les apostes per comprar, per adquirir objectes, això entra també en aquest cercle del que seria una història de l'economia. Però també altres qüestions molt interessants per a nosaltres. El tema, quan estudia les col·leccions científiques, per exemple, el tema de les de les pràctiques. Ell és un estudiós intensiu de les pràctiques, de què es fa amb la materialitat de la ciència. I això ens ha portat també 
a, a fixar la atención en, en aquellas partes de, de la historia que tienen esa veura en la historia del arte. Y también en los visual studies. Así es, un, y, 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 y por tanto, en toda esta eh, trayectoria historiográfica que, que centra la atención, que centra la mirada en la cultura material, ¿no? en, la, en la materialidad científica, en las formas, en, en cómo aquellos objetos eh, es fan y después acaban de tener significado. En aquel sentido, un otro de los elementos que ella acaba estudiando es el de la arquitectura, es decir, el space. Los espais eh, eh, como a tals, como objeto de recerca, tienen un, 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 un pes absolutamente crucial en la seva, en la seva recerca. Bé, tot, tot, tots aquests elements, eh, doncs, eh, des de la meva perspectiva, son, eh, forman una, una, una mirada complexa a la historia que construéis. Y, y, y ve, de feta, así no es el, 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 aquests no son los puntos más, más importantes de la, seva, de la seva manera de fer historia. Porque eh, en, la, en la recerca de San Alberti, el que trova sobre todo es una, eh, un interés absolutamente fundamental y crucial para saber cómo los objetos adquieren significado. Y cuando se es, 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 es plantea eso, el que se pregunta es sobre la mirada de los visitantes, que de alguna manera es para hoy una mica, ¿no? los, los públics. Los publics, ¿no? Una cosa, aquellos publics de la ciencia de los cuales tan, tan se han preocupado en aquellos de Resigns, eh, yo creo que San Alberti eh, el sitúa permanentemente en el centro de, de la seva recerca, ¿no? Y, y eso es muy interesante, ¿no? Porque de alguna manera es, es, un, es una, una historia que tiene siempre dos dues miradas, ¿no? Se entra en la mirada en el museo y en las seves colecciones, pero a Matías Tem se intenta estudiar, intenta entender con las colecciones no tengan sentido, sino cuando eh, eh, nosotros de una manera activa les pusimos significado. ¿no? Nosotros decir, o ve los visitantes, o ve los curators, o ve los que las compran, o ve las autoridades que deciden construir y, y portar a terma una, una, una exposición, un museo o el que sigue. Ve todo eso, el que hace es eh, una, una, la, una recerca, la de San Alberti, absolutamente ineludible para, 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 para los que se interesan a estas cuestiones ¿no? de, de la historia de la ciencia, que creo que en la sala son som algunos que, que estén muy interesados en todo eso. ¿no? Le he parlat una mica ahora rápidamente de todos vosotros y del que feo, o sí sea, que eh, puché eh, cuando acaben de, de hablar, si no le hice preguntas, os interpelará a vosotros porque sabe a qué os dediqué y las reservas que estoy portando a terma. ¿Vale? Bueno, eh, sorry, eh, Sam. Eh, I was introducing you, eh, you in, eh, to, to my colleagues and, and, and explaining that not only eh, the, your, your biography and your. Eh, background, but also uh, I was uh, explaining uh, um, uh, my whole life story. Huh? Yeah, more or less. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. all lies. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I give you the, go the word and, and, and after that, after 40, 45 minutes more or less, uh, we, can, we can establish a, a conversation uh, with you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Sam. Thank you for the... Um Thank you for the invitation um, to your beautiful city. Edinburgh is also a beautiful city, but the weather here is slightly better. Um, I, I couldn't follow all of my introduction. Um, there was something about Glasgow. That certainly wasn't me. Um, but I am Sam Alberti, and I apologize, uh, Perdoni, uh, even though I uh, me chiamo Alberti, I'm not even Italian. I'm from Newcastle in the north of England, and so I have no language skills. So please forgive uh, 45 minutes in English, um, but there are some nice pictures, um, I hope. Um, as you've already heard, I think I've uh, enjoyed working in Manchester for 10 years, and then London for five years, and now Scotland for six weeks. Uh, Manchester, I was mostly interested in museum objects that had fur and feathers. In London, I had responsibility for objects of flesh and bone. Um, and now I'm in charge of, you know, astrolabes and aeroplanes and things. Um, so I'm, as we say in English, a, a jack of all trades, um, certainly master of none. But one thing I've been very interested in, in all of these uh, really interesting collections, um, is their history, their provenance, um, and their publics. 
And what I'll try to do uh, this evening, and thank you for giving up your, your Friday evening um, for this, what I'll try to do is to combine those two. Um, so it's a, it's a talk of, of two parts, really. Uh, one looking at the history of visitors to medical museums and the difficulties in trying to uncover them. And then looking at visitors to medical museums now and in particular, I'm interested in how visitor stories, patient stories, become worked into medical museum displays, how medical museum displays can be the stories of patients as well as the stories of doctors. So I think there's a common thread running through the two parts, if there is, is about how we feature in medical museum displays. Um, and I'll talk broadly about medical museums in the UK. I'll use my former institution, the Royal College of Surgeons, uh, which has the Hunterian Museum, which we'll meet in a moment. Um, and I'll also talk about some of the biomedical displays we're putting into the new expositions at the National Museum of Scotland in the centre of Edinburgh, uh, which we're in the process of opening up um, six large new galleries of science and technology and there are biomedical elements worked in. So I'll pick a couple of examples from there as well. One should also add that um, when we're talking about medical museums, there's two quite distinct categories of collection here. There's organic medical museums, the anatomy and pathology and um, you know models and things that go with them, which is very closely aligned to natural history museums, natural science museums, things that used to be alive. But there's also medical history museums, which is more about the surgical instruments um, and medical material culture. And these collections are much more closely aligned with science and technology museums. Now, some collections have both, but often they're quite separate. And I think that's an interesting distinction but I think there are common themes between them as I'll try to draw some of those out. But, oh, and this, by the way, is uh, the artist's impression of these new galleries in Edinburgh that we're looking forward to open, that my colleagues um, are working very hard on as, as we speak, whilst I make, I'm conscious I'm being filmed, whilst I make important international connections uh, with, with Barcelona, whilst they're working very hard. So, even though I no longer work for the Royal College of Surgeons, their Hunterian Museum, I would still claim, is one of the most important medical museums in the English-speaking world, certainly. Um, and this Hunterian Museum, there's another Hunterian Museum, we'll come back to that, um, started with the collection of John Hunter, who was an 18th century surgeon anatomist from Scotland, who moved and worked um, in London. He set up a, uh, an anatomy museum with uh, healthy anatomy, diseased anatomy, and comparative anatomy, that is to say natural history. Um, and it was originally housed in his private residence. Um, this is a reconstruction of um, his home and anatomy school. On the left, you can see uh, their, their home, where they had the soiree and the conversazioni and the great and the good of London. On the right at the back is the dirty, uh, grotty business end, the anatomy school where the medical students lived and the bodies came. And in the middle, in this liminal space, in the middle is the museum. And that museum's function, the reason people visited that museum, and he let quite a lot of people come, but it was only you know, uh, the elite or his students the reason for this museum was for his own prestige, for his own research, and for teaching. And these three functions of prestige, professional prestige, and research and teaching, in different combinations, remain remarkably constant as reasons to visit a medical museum over the following um, 250 years. That collection, like many other private collections in the 18th century, became part of a public collection, uh, an institutional collection in the 19th century. And this is the Hunterian Museum um, in 1842. 
In the robe there pointing to the giant sloth is Richard Owen, the uh, comparative anatomist and paleontologist um, based at the Hunterian at that time who, who fashioned himself, who thought of himself as the British Cuvier. I don't know if that was fair. Um, and the collection there is still meant to be for students, for trainee doctors, but you can see also in this representation the fashionable curious. And this curiosity is something that endures. And they were permitted, the upper middle classes and the upper classes were permitted by the council of the college at, you know, at their um, uh, gift. So it was very much restricted. It was open to non-medical, but only of the right social class. What's interesting is the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh, which is not where I work now, I work at the National Museum, but the Surgeons Museum in Edinburgh had an experiment in the 19th century where they permitted the working classes, and it went very well, and that's quite an interesting historical episode. But for the most part, these medical museums, and we should remember that every university medical faculty, every royal college, every medical society would have had its own museum, often with a lot of comparative anatomy, as you can see here. These, the, these so-called orthodox museums are one side of a sort of, of a coin, of a yin-yang, of Janus faced with, on the other side, if this is high culture, then we also have the low culture, the panopticon, the waxworks, the um, uh, commercial anatomy shows. And you'll be familiar with the uh, phenomenon of the anatomical Venus, um, this one from La Specula, but they were very common across Europe. And what's interesting here is the motivation for visiting. This is, again, meant to be educational, but we know this was for titillation as well. There's sexual overtones to this. And the second point is that she can be taken apart. So she's designed to be handled, mostly we think by the lecturer rather than the student, but they are hands-on um, uh, objects here. So in the mid 19th century in London and in many other cities in the United Kingdom, there are many of these exhibitions, whether they're permanent or semi-permanent or they're traveling. Kahn's Anatomical Museum had traveled around Europe before arriving um, in London and going around the UK, and we know that there's particularly interesting um, examples of this category of museum here in Barcelona, as we know from Alphonse's work. And again, these are meant to be for education. They're meant to be for education for the, uh, for the working classes, for, the, for working men and women separately, but men and women. And they're meant to be about for the working people to know thyself, to know yourself, to get to know their own anatomy. We also know from uh, 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 the way they were marketed and some of the very few visitor responses that the emphasis was very much on um, debauchery and sexual diseases and a lot of the wax works were around syphilis um, and other what we'd now call sexually transmitted infections. And at Welcome Collection in London recently there was a, um, a, sh a show that had this sort of draw the curtain back to see these um, uh, dermatological wax works. And there's a rather nice account. There are very few uh, eyewitness accounts of these sorts of museums. Um, but there's a rather nice account from a medical student in the 1860s who went to see Dr. Kahn's museum in the afternoon, a decidedly indecent pseudoscientific affair. It didn't stop him going. Founded by a quack doctor. Lecture on deleterious influences. I don't quite know what deleterious means, let alone what deleterious influences, but one suspects this, was, this wasn't good, clean fun. It was, of course, disgusting, and yet he stayed for the whole thing. He then has a rather serious attack of diarrhea, a malady to which I'm seldom subject. Can it have been bestowed on me by an all-wise providence, this God punishing him, as a punishment for having visited that sink of iniquity, Dr. Khan's museum yesterday. Who knows? He may have been punished 
for having gone to this sordid, low-culture museum when he should be studying at one of the many hospital museums in London. So these museums continue through the century and throughout the UK. There's a backlash against them in the 1860s on the grounds of obscenity. So when new obscenity laws kick in in the 1860s, a lot of these museums are closed down for obscenity and there are um, possibly apocryphal accounts of waxworks being broken up because they're obscene. And this is a common trope we get in the history of anatomical museums um, across Europe. At the same time, remember that the Orthodox museums, the teaching hospital museums, had a lot of the same material, a lot of these waxworks that could be construed as titillating or sexual. There's a lot of the um, dermatological moulage around the, the uh, consequences of sexual activity. These museums, which had been broadly open earlier in the first half of the century, these museums are very much, and this is the museum at uh, Guy's Hospital in London, they're, they're very much restricted in their access. They're growing and the student numbers are growing, but the general public visits, even for the more elite, are fewer. And you can see also they're controlling the visit. The visit which had been nice and conversational early, they're chatting, it's a place for, to display yourself. Now it's much more restricted and uh, policed. But it's still ostensibly used by students. This is the Barts Medical Museum, um, Pathological Museum, around 1900, which is one of the largest ones. It's huge, great catalogues at this period. And you can just see the suspiciously studious um, uh, young man on the right. Um, so these aren't kind of crowded, jostly places. These are very much modeled architecturally and um, in their display technology like libraries. These are meant to be encyclopedias of disease and they should be treated appropriately. And at the similar time across the cultural spectrum, it's at this period that um, certainly in, in Britain, um, theater audiences and opera audiences are, are much more controlled and policed and quietened. So the visiting experience is a much more controlled experience. Nonetheless, they are, in the first decades of the 20th century, um, huge. There are many of them, and they run into tens of thousands of specimens. So top left is another view of uh, Bart's Museum, and you can just see, in the top left picture, in the bottom left of it, you can just see some students. There are other large, um, important museums here. Um, can anyone name any of them? It's a little bit of a specific question. You encountered any of these? Yeah. It's a little bit of an unfair um, uh, question. Bottom right is, is one of my favorite medical museums, which I'll we'll return to, is in Berlin. This is the, uh, um, pardon? In Berlin. Uh, charity, yeah. yeah, this is, uh, uh, at the time, the Pathological Instant, um, Institute of Rudolf Virchow, um, which is now the Medical History Museum at the Charité. Top right is the largest medical museum in the United States. This is what was the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, now the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Bottom left is one of the museums set up by the Wellcome Foundation, as it was then. That's the uh, Welcome Museum of Medical Science, as opposed to the Welcome History Museum, which we'll come back to later. But what's interesting is if we start now thinking about not only what these museums are for and who's visiting them, but also thinking about how patients are represented in the displays. Previously, you might have had some accounts of the person who's body part is being displayed, and they're mostly body parts. And there might have been some case history around them. The case histories remain, but in this period, in the early 20th century, they become anonymized. The human remains in the museum become much more uh, scientific data. They become depersonalized and objectified in this period. It's partly to do with the sheer quantity, 
and it's partly to do with the um, scientific method in medicine at the time, and especially um, in medical education. And they carry on through the um, 20th century. Uh, this is a mid-20th century image from the Edinburgh University Anatomy Museum, another museum in Edinburgh that I don't work at, um, but I'm very fond of. Um, and what's interesting here is you've got the, the students using the collections um, as they ought to be with, you know, still the remnants of the comparative anatomy enterprise of the 19th century there with the rather large elephant. Um, and also John on the right is John Goodsir's um, cast uh, from, from the 1840s. So these sort of historical remnants are carrying on into the museum. Um, but at this stage, they're getting used less and less. And so sh not long after this image must have been taken, um, this museum, which had been a huge three-story museum, um, is reduced to just one floor of it. And they slice through and they use the rest of the space for laboratories and um, teaching areas in the 1950s. But. By this time, the mid 20th century, there's another way of collecting medicine and displaying medicine that is becoming much more um, noticeable. And this is looking not at a medical museum as a, an anatomical teaching facility, but a medical museum as a, a site for heritage, for celebrating and commemorating the medical profession. And much more commonly done not with human remains, but with historic uh, material culture, with um, medical instruments and bits of kit. So the uh, Royal College of Surgeons had its Ontarian Museum, and alongside that began at the, in the late 19th century to gather material relating to famous surgeons and famous instances of surgery. And this is especially, it was already underway in the 1890s and the early 1900s, and you see this in um, uh, institutes across Europe, I think. But when Joseph Lister, the antisepsis pioneer, died in 1912, there's almost a sort of tug of love over his collection, his collection of instruments. And what I was always fond of was this, this case, which was custom made in 1924, the one on the right. You can see his famous antiseptic spray on the far right, and then his uh, examination couch um, on the left, but in the middle there is a, is a case that was made in 1924, it's since been redisplayed, but it was made as to house his instruments, and they had the instruments he'd designed, the instruments he'd used, the instruments he'd been given, and included in those instruments he'd been given were instruments he didn't like and thought they weren't any good, but still, because they were part of the hallowed, sanctified Lister collection, they've become part of this, this shrine this holy place for surgeons to visit. So if you're a British surgeon, you come to a museum like the Hunterian Museum to pay your respects to the, to the great men of surgery, to John Hunter, to Joseph Lister, and it's part of your professional um, identity. So it's this theme of prestige that we saw with John Hunter running through, but now much more focused on historic instruments. And one can't talk about the history of medical heritage in the UK without um, identifying Henry Solomon Wellcome um, and his influence as a collector and a funder, even though he was shock um, American. Um, he was nonetheless knighted um, and gathered, made a lot of money with uh, pharmaceuticals and gathered what was probably the largest private collection, certainly in the United you know, the, Britain has ever seen. I mean, not just the largest medical collection, but the largest collection full stop. When they broke it up long after his death in the 1970s, they, uh, the elements that went to the Science Museum, the, the medical elements, were 114,000 items, which increased the Science Museum's quantity of objects by, by twofold. And when they deaccessioned, when they, the elements that no one wanted, when they deaccessioned, which you know usually is a very careful, you know, minute process that you carefully 
you know, removed from your collection. They did his by the ton. They did it by thousands of kilograms. It was extraordinary. But he also left a great deal of money. Um, oh, in the bottom right are the um, uh, displays that the Science Museum in London uh, put together using his collection in the 1980s. They've since closed those and are now working on new medical history displays in London, which should open in 2019, which I think will be among the largest medical displays in the world, to my knowledge. Um, and then they'll also be uh, rather good. I mean, don't tell them that, it'll go to their heads, but they're doing really good work down there. Henry Welcome also left a large um, foundation. Uh, most of it is used for medical research, but a small fraction of the total is used for medical heritage. And that small fraction is still so large that it, it has a massive impact on um, the heritage sector in the UK generally. So when we were thinking about the visits to medical museums that were dwindling in the mid 20th century, there's a burst of interest and activity um, from about 20 years ago. And this is when institutions that have these large collections are beginning to think about what to do with them. Some are mothballed, um, you know, put away in cupboards or disposed of, especially after there's uh, legislation around in 2004, which makes it, which means that you need to hold a license to display um, human remains of a certain age. I mean, quite rightly. But that means that those institutions that hold these remains have to either do something proactive with them or dispose of them. And those collections that um, uh, went forward um, often did so with the help of the Wellcome Trust and other funders. Um, and I've included some examples here. Top right is the redisplayed Hunterian Museum in London, in, which was redisplayed in 2005. The large one on the left is the, the new displays at the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh, which opened last September. Um, and in the middle there, dressed as Pitt Cairn, um, is my opposite number there, Chris Henry, who likes to be in a, in a photograph. But it, I think it looks rather fetching. Bottom right is the Muta Museum in Philadelphia, which is um, uh, it's a very successful medical museum um, in the United States. So there's this big qualitative change around about 2000 in uh, medical heritage, and those that really concentrate do well. The Wellcome Collection as well um, reopens um, in 2007 and is phenomenally um, uh, popular, although they now badge themselves not as a medical collection, but as a general cultural attraction. Um, so it's interesting that they've taken it in a completely new and interesting, different direction. But if we're thinking about how patients are represented, we touched on this before, now moving on to the kind of second and shorter part of the paper, you'll be pleased to know. Um, thinking about how patients are represented, how you and I are represented in those collections, a lot of the human remains are anonymized. A lot of the material culture is around the clinician, not the patient. And so this is especially true of those collections that are based on a particular medic, a particular doctor. So the Hunterian Museum um, top right is based, you know, still is very much about celebrating John Hunter and Joseph Lister. Top right on this slide is the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow, which still bears his name, even though the collections have um, exploded long beyond his original remit. We also have Dr. Jenner's house, celebrating the, uh, the Jenner as a, as a pioneer, which is top uh, left. Bottom right is uh, the Alexander Fleming Museum, um, celebrating his achievements with penicillin. And bottom left to show that it, you know, the entire healthcare industry has, uh, hasn't only had men for, for 200 years is the Florence Nightingale Museum, um, which is about the history of nursing. Now, all of these do important work and all of these talk about the patients, but ultimately they're focused quite rightly on the professions of, um, on the, their founders and the professions that they represent. One can find 
patients in medical museums, though. I mean, in these as well, the Florence Nightingale is very good at looking at the impact on patients. Um, and I just want to now, probably for most of the rest of the uh, talk, just look at some examples of where patients can appear in medical museums. We've explained how the sort of depersonalized human remains and the celebratory, prestigious material culture associated with clinicians has come about. But I think now we can start to think about how we merge the two and how we ensure that as patients, our experiences are represented in the displays that we're looking at. We're reflected in and of themselves, ourselves. The two ways of doing this, and I'll focus on um, the ways that patient narratives and patient stories and patient experiences can be um, reflected in permanent displays. There's a lot more we could talk about um, that we won't have time for today uh, about the role of fine art and artists' interventions, which um, is a very successful way of helping us to think about patients. But I'll concentrate on the permanent galleries using the collections first. This, as you can see, is what the Charité Museum that we, we met earlier um, is one of the galleries there now. It's a, uh, an old ward of the Charité Hospital that has 10 beds, and each bed, so-called bed, has the story of a particular patient, told with text, told with images, told with specimens, and told with material. Uh, it's a very simple but very effective mode of display for me. So we've got right from a young pregnant woman um, from in 1727 who had a difficult birth, a three-year-old boy with polio um, who uh, uh, was treated with an iron lung and so forth, so forth, right up until one of the patients in 2006. I mean, that's a whole gallery devoted to patient stories. Elsewhere, we can find them woven through displays. This is a very simple, very small, I mean, it's only, sorry, I don't have the, the measurement on this. It's only, you know, 10, 15 centimeters. Um, and this is a little sampler, a little bit of embroidery undertaken by Charlotte Waite, who was in 1848, um, 11 years old. She lost her leg in an accident. Uh, uh, she had an accident, had to have her leg amputated, but was one of the first patients to um, have the operation under chloroform. So this is part of the um, anesthetics section in the Hunterian Museum, and to me is exceptionally powerful, just this one tiny little bit of material culture. More recent history at the Hunterian Museum, we uh, commemorated the outbreak of the First World War by displaying a series of patient um, images uh, paint, uh, in pastel by Henry Tonks of plastic surgery patients. Um, on the right is William Ashworth, who was wounded in the Battle of the Somme and was then treated. Um, on the left was one of a series of uh, commissioned works by artist Julia Midgley, who went to, to match these series of 70 Tonks pastels. She went and sketched recovering service personnel who'd been wounded by uh, improvised explosive devices in Afghanistan and Iraq. So on the left is um, Andy Reid, who was um, um, injured by an IED um, in 2012. And this is him having his outpatient treatment and his prostheses fitted. Some of the more historic specimens Remains of humans um, also have their stories uh, put forth. This is Charles Byrne, who was known during his life as the Irish giant. And there's a debate um, between uh, various members of the audience and stakeholders in London about whether his likely last wishes should be respected and his remains dropped in the sea. And so there's a debate there, which is very, very much wrapped around the that we know a great deal about this particular patient. And it's interesting that he didn't want to be dissected, but neither would most patients before the mid-19th century. 
So it's interesting because we know his story, a lot of attention is paid um, to that. But every, I would argue, every pathological specimen is evidence of the experience of a disease, the experience of living with difficulty and deviance. And so this curved spine would have caused incredible discomfort. We don't know the name of the patient. We don't know very much about her, but we do know, we can empathize that she has lived with you know, incredible discomfort for a long time. And the uh, response in the audio guide at the Hunter Museum by a historian who lives with this condition, I find very moving. Turning down now from you know, historic specimens from uh, 250 years ago to an exhibition, um, part of an exhibition that was installed yesterday, top right. Um, these are um, part of a display in the National Museum of Scotland Science and Technology Gallery. Um, this one, a gallery called Enquire, and it's a display about asthma. And it's a display about uh, the technologies of treatment. And so my colleagues there, uh, assistant curator Sophie Goggins and uh, senior curator Tacey Phillipson uh, worked on this. And they worked with asthma, people who live with asthma, to talk about their experiences of the condition and their, um, their associations with the material culture that went with it. So the asthma inhaler, as you can see on the left, is a very, it's a ubiquitous piece of medical material culture um, that many of us will use or have in our homes or have family members who use. And I think it's important to have items like this in a medical display, in a technology display, because it's not simply talking about firsts and innovation and new treatment. It's talking about the everyday and the experience of living with a condition like this. So the sports person you can see displayed there is uh, Scott McLeod, who's a rugby player, rugby union player. So this goes down very well to the heart of, of uh, what Edinburgh publics like to see. And he lives with asthma. And it's about the patients that my colleagues worked with felt it very important that um, there be role models there for uh, how, you know, for the patient story, that this isn't a, a, just a story of um, disease and difficulty, but a, a story of celebrating another sort of hero. So not the medical hero, but the sporting hero. Another fascinating uh, case in both senses in the new galleries at National Museum Scotland. Oh, if anyone's tweeting, I imagine that we've got a Twitter handle or something, but I, I have no idea what it is, but you can poke us, I'm, I'm sure. Um, this is around uh, the so-called Lothian birth cohort, uh, whereby in 1936 and in 1921, this is from the 1936 cohort, um, there was, the, they commenced the Scottish Mental Health Survey. Um, and this followed a group of um, uh, children at first, um, through adulthood, um, all the way through now to, um, in this case, their, their 80th year. So this is John Scott, who is uh, second from the right on the bottom row in the um, a school class photograph, and then this is him earlier this year. And they've, um, over the decades, tracked them, traced them, tested them, and more recently started using modern medical technology to um, scan their brains. And we used, or my colleagues used, or worked with the university to use the scans from, um, this is John Scott, scans from John's brain to make a uh, three-dimensional model that we'll meet later, and also a laser-etched model of the white matter, the neural connections in John's brain. Um, and apparently it's very interesting because his brain is slightly off-center, but it hasn't done his, him any harm. Um, and 
as he says himself, and I quote, I hope I'm helping. Uh, with each passing year of this study, they glean new data. And so John's, the models of John's brain, and we'll see the other one later, um, will feature in the displays. And again, it's hoping to look at these biomedical elements and more broadly about in the history of technology, looking at use and looking at user experience and patient experience, as well as you know, exciting innovations and huge aeroplanes and so on. I won't dwell on a series of um, recent and not so recent um, artist projects that look at the patient experience, but um, all of them are uh, available in published or online form. Karen Ingham uh, is an artist who worked in the Hunterian Museum reimagining the narratives, the patient narratives of a particular set of human remains. Emma Barnard works uh, with uh, patients um, in, in um, recent patients um, in hospitals looking at depersonalized, depersonalization um, in medicine. Uh, I've been remain involved with a project called Exceptional and Extraordinary, which is looking at representations and experiences of disability in medical museums. It's a very challenging, very important, and very interesting topic. And in this project, um, artists have been brought in to work with eight different medical museums um, in, in Britain to interpret and reflect upon their experiences. And these aren't fine artists like Julia Midgley, um, but uh, in these cases from, you know, uh, uh, left to right, a choreographer, um, a comedian, a performance artist, and a filmmaker. So I'll see the first outputs of this. Um, actually, they'll be performing it in Edinburgh, although this is showing them in the, the wonderful store in the Hunterian Museum. And the final example is a... Uh, a project by a sound artist and a photographer, Tim Wainwright and John Wynne, um, where it's only the patient narrative and images of the patients and their experience. And they're looking at um, transplant patients. Um, and they produce very moving images and also they record the, um, the voices and the words of um, uh, transplant patients, which as you can imagine is quite an intense um, experience. And I've chosen this example, um, of course, uh, because uh, this particular patient is a Newcastle United fan. Um, uh, and I, to my misfortune, um, share his interest in that football club. And that to my knowledge, will be uh, refreshed and reworked and redisplayed in the Hunterian Museum um, in London um, within the next uh, 12 months, I hope. So reflecting then on people visiting medical museums and people represented in medical museums, obviously, Publics and audiences come and go. They come for different reasons. They come in greater numbers or lesser numbers. But some elements, I think, remain constant. There's a curiosity. There's a prurient curiosity. There's, uh, there's sensationalism. And what's interesting in uh, trying, at least, to be both a historian of medical museums and a practitioner in museums is the tension between the uh, emphasizing the, the worthiness and the value of medical museums and um, museums of biomedicine um, as educational, enlightening tools where people will hopefully come to, to learn. And on the flip side of that, we know that people come to, to be outraged and to be horrified and disgusted by human remains and representations of the body. And we know that that gets people in. So the uh, Muta Museum in, in Philadelphia has a different economic model to many museums in the UK and they have to raise their own money. And they do this by going 
explicitly for the curious, for, the, for what we call the dark tourism, and they, they cash in on this. Nonetheless, it's uh, curated very well, it's historically rigorous, it's anatomically sound, but they mark it in a very different way. This tension between the high and low culture, the artificial separation I made before, I mean, if you looked at Kahn's Medical Museum catalog and the catalog of Bart's Hospital Pathology Museum, there's a lot of the same headings, there's a lot of the same language. If you look at a Royal College of Surgeons Museum now and Gunther von Hagen's, there's a lot of the same tropes and narratives coming through. It's just perhaps that one is more honest than the other about you know, the motivations for visiting, who knows. But throughout this, I think what unites them is this fascination with what we're looking at. There's something particular about medical museums in that we're looking either at parts of humans or material culture and tools and equipment that is used to interfere with the body. And so when we're looking, we're feeling, well, I hope, and I hope I never lose this, one is feeling empathy with either the human represented in the case or the people who were treated using these instruments that we're looking at, whether it be an asthma um, uh, inhaler or a, uh, an amputation saw. And I know that you know audiences, even with just this motion, you sometimes, with the light-hearted, not with seasoned professionals as yourselves, but you are sometimes will get the wince from that. And I think this is why it's very important to have not only the story of the, the justifiably celebrated doctors, nurses, healthcare practitioners who worked so hard um, and did so much to improve patient experience, but also the patient experience themselves. And I think with John Scott here, I'll end because we need to see ourselves re reflected back from the medical museum display case. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. Now, now it's, it's time uh, for some debate, uh, dialogue uh, with our colleague. If you have some, some questions, now is the moment to make it, make them. Oliver, thank you. <laughs> We, so in Planetary Science, uh, try to get hold of the experiences of patients and visitors. And, um, I just read a book by a British historian, Helen Cowie, uh, about uh, zoos and menageries mm. in 19th century Britain. Right? So, not history of medicine, history of science, or history of natural history. And, Mm, it's, it's incredible the amount of sources she found to reconstruct the experience of visitors to zoos and to itinerant menageries. Like, we tend to say, oh, it's very, very hard to find you know, any sources at all, and if, if I'm very lucky, like a, a diary, but the book is 200 pages and full of it. And the main source are our newspapers and reports about all the accidents that happened at the menageries and all the you know, lion tamers that got attacked and whatever and the lion that escaped. And there are so many stories around zoos and menageries that are very newsworthy. And um, but she quotes from dozens and dozens of newspapers throughout the entire 19th century. So I, could not, I still don't understand how she could do that. So, is it is so much digitalized in the, in the, in the of, of, of British newspapers that you can just because no one can look through all these newspapers, you know, uh, in, in in any reasonable uh, amount of time. And so that's one question: Are they all digitalized? Is it much better than I don't know, Spain or 
okay. is there not could not the same thing be done for for you know your topic um, uh, history of medicine and, and in particular medical museums and uh, anatomical collections and so on and so forth because you might expect you know similar things people flogging and whatever to an exhibition outside of this and that. Mm. And, so on. We, get, we always have to look, you know, what, what gets into the news is often when something happens, like an accident or some a moral outcry because of this. Uh, well, this is an excellent question and observation. And firstly, um, um, Helen's book is is very good and very thorough. And uh, I'm uh, I'm lazier than she is. <laughs> um, it, it's the the. There's excellent newspaper digital coverage, certainly for the London um, newspapers, and um, she did a phenomenal amount of work, but it is easier now because one can keyword search for menagerie, but that didn't, you know, she then had to sit and read through every instance. Um, so one can do that, and there's some really useful newspaper coverage. The challenge with anatomical museums, from my experience of, of of using newspaper resources, although not as not as thoroughly as, as Helen did, is um, that a lot of it is what we'd now call spin. So the newspaper accounts of anatomy shows, for example, so there's a, there's some really nice sources for the Khans and these commercial, sh commercial shows. Um, the difficulty there is a lot of it is, is planted. It's, um, you know, comes, obviously the copy has come straight from the anatomy show. Um, so you don't get the, um, you get some, you know, journalists and so on, but most of it is kind of recycled um, copy. There's a lot around these shows and the um, uh, other medical museums contrasting when, when these obscenity debates are going on um, in the 1860s. Um, and there are some nice accounts. Um, so I got very excited because I thought I'd found... Uh, an account of Charles Dickens visiting the Hunterian Museum, which would have been great, but it was it was in a Dickens publication, but it was a journalist called Frederick Knight Hunt. So there are some, and they are good, but the problem is that um, if one is looking at museums that aren't strictly public, so if one's interested in student responses to educational museums, then it's more difficult. That said, I had a wonderful opportunity with sources in um, for the Gordon Museum at Guy's. There was a student, an internal, informal student newspaper that had just three or four accounts of um, the, patho you know, the pathology museum. That um, and this isn't digitised and so on. But that was that was a wonderful um, uh, luck on my account. But that had. You know, the, the, the other side of this, you know, you look at these very studious young men in, in well, in, in, in that image, or young man and woman in that image, and these, the, the student there, there's a wonderful um, satirical account in a student newspaper. That's Bart's Museum, but this was in, in, in the Gordon Museum, which is um, this one, of... Um, a sort of how-to guide of the Pathology Museum where it says you must make as much noise on the upper gallery of the museum scraping your stool across to show that you are there and studying very hard. But this isn't, I don't think one can make a terribly strong, um, you know, historiographical case from this. So my long answer to your uh, uh, very good question was that Alan has done a lot of very hard work digital resources for newspapers. Certainly the major newspapers are now much better, and um, uh, especially around London and Edinburgh and the capitals. Um, but there's a difficulty there with medical museums in particular because so many of them for so long are not public and wouldn't make it into the, um, you know, the Times of London or whatever. I mean, they do, there's debates around them in the medical press, um, but this isn't so much about, you know, what it felt like to visit that museum. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, Laura. Actually, um, more about the 
the controversy about the Irish oh, yes. how uh, the museum um, uh, resolved that controversy um, yeah, sure. Um, now, this is interesting. This is the first time I've spoken about the uh, controversy around Charles Burns since I left the Royal College of Surgeons, and we're, we're being recorded here. But I will say now what I said then, because I think the college has done the right thing, in that without condoning Hunter's practice, he you know, uh, acquired this these remains likely by bribery in a way that no one's going to collect human remains today. Um, that damage has been done. And the reason the college had decided um, as a medical institution, and technically a private museum, but as a medical institution, was to privilege patients today. So standing on the, on the, in, the, in the middle is Marta Corbinitz, an endocrinologist, and on the right is Brendan Holland. Now, the work that Marta and her team did connected Brendan Holland to Charles Byrne. Now, he's not a descendant. Byrne had no children, but they share an ancestor. And also, as you can see, um, Brendan Holland uh, lived with the same condition, the same giantism that Charles Byrne did. The difference being, Byrne died of it age around 21 because it was untreated. Brendan Holland uh, was treated um, as a young man and is now, you know, lived into retirement, um, is tall, but only a little bit taller than me. Now, he, Brendan, is uh, very keen that Burns remains, stay with the college and are available for the sort of um, careful use that Marta and the endocrinologists used the remains for to develop screening programs, they identified the gene responsible. Now there's arguments there about, you say, well, if you're gonna keep it just in case further research, that's not a particularly strong argument. What is strong is that the, the patient groups who live with this condition now are happy that his remains stay there. The endocrinologists are keen for his remains to stay, and it's a medical organization, and those individuals who share an ancestor and share a condition with him that we know of, that have spoken, that they know of, that have spoken to the college, are happy that he remained there. That, those three qualifications may not be the case forever, um, but it's an extremely interesting example of medical museum ethics, and it's a difficult stance that the college has taken, but I think the right one. even though I don't work for them. Yeah. Yeah. I have three questions. Um, uh, how should we teach the medical museum uh, to the children? Ooh. And what is the principal role of the muse museography in this kind of museum? And exists or exists interactivity with object and visitors? Well, right there, you've outlined, you know, the three main challenges that, you know, medical curators spend their careers <laughs> tackling. So you immediately cut right through. Um, so thank you um, uh, for those. Um, the issue of children and age is a very interesting one. The Hunterian Museum at the Royal College of Surgeons and other similar museums like that are not for children. Children are permitted but the reading age is, you know, for a smart 14-year-old, as opposed to a public museum that would be a reading age of about 10. Um, the educational um, uh, resources and facilities are, when they're for school children, they're for school children of uh, modern England is key stage four. So 14 to 16-year-olds learning about um, history of medicine and so on. So in a museum like that, Although it is very popular with families, it's advised that younger children be brought with an adult and, and there's care because it's quite, you know, it's quite, can be quite moving and effective. And I think, I think there's no shying away from this. This, this is difficult material um, to tackle. So I know that, that 
my kids, for example, my, my son at least, liked it at first before it dawned on him what it was he was looking at at a age about eight or so. That said, there's a very different imperative to a museum like National Museum of Scotland, and especially a Science and Technology Gallery with its um, push buttons, and I'll come back to interactivity um, in a moment. Um, that's a much broader um, audience and includes family audiences and, and young children and a great variety. Um, and I think there, you engage a child, I think, as you would the rest of us with simple stories that hook onto a particular experience. So I think part of my answer is, is to tell stories of patients. Um, and you know, if, and if a young child with, who lives with asthma sees the, the, um, the inhaler in the case and thinks, oh, well, this is interesting and this, and there are other people who live with this, maybe that will help. Um, and you know, perhaps, you know, one doesn't want to, overstate this, but if you see, well, look, and this rugby player has asthma, maybe I can not be a you know, national level sports person, but you know, maybe this won't hold me back. Uh, coming to your third question next on interactivity, I'm cautious about interactivity in medical museums because one wants to not to shy away from this being difficult material. That said, there's some very good interactive, digital interactive, so touch screen, around the, all the displays in the National Museum of Scotland, new displays. And a lot of these, there's issues around genetic testing and difficult decisions like that, which are laid out rather well. So done well, and with a particular aim in mind, I think there is a role for interactivity if it's supplementing um, you know, very powerful material alongside it. And finally, the, what's the principal role of medical museums? Um, I think, and not just because this has been, I hope, the message of our talk, is, is to reflect ourselves back at us, to think about the lived experience of patients and of health and disease through time, I think, now and then. You can you can make questions uh, also about uh, other uh, things uh, regarding the historiography written by Sam, if you want. If I can remember it. <laughs> yeah, <I still> can. <laughs> All right. mm, it's, it's just a, a tiny question. Um, because in, in parts you were talking about the visitors of, of medical museum, which is distinct from the, the, the patients. Um, that example gave the, the first part about this medical student was, was a, a visitor, and the people you showed on the photos are not professional patients, they're not visitors yeah. or users of yeah. medical institutions. Then the second half, you more or less exclusively talked about, um, about patients, and yeah, I mean, coming back to the to the comparison with, with Cowie, I mean, the, the patients would be the animals, the yeah. patient, the, the ones being looked at, and uh, the visitors are, in this example, like the, the, the human beings looking at animals or looking at, 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 at medical museums. So, what does that mean for the historian? Uh, it means you spotted that I had um, taken, I wanted to give two papers and I decided to give them both. Um, um, so that's what it means for me. Um, in a more general point, um, and I think this is what is particular about medical museums, is that we are all potentially patients. So that's why the title I gave was Med Medical Museums and Their Publics rather than Medical Museums and Their Visitors, because they're publics are not only, they're on both sides of the case, or the experience, if, if it's an instrument, it's you know, the experience is on um, both sides of the case. But I think that's what differentiates a medical museum and what makes the experience particular, as opposed to a natural history museum or a, or a museum of art, is, is that you are looking at um, human 
um, on the other side, and that's a particular empathetic response. Not that people don't have empathetic response when they look at animals in cases. So when I worked at the Manchester Museum, which was an a interdisciplinary museum, I don't know if it was precisely true, but the, the rule of, you know, the, the, the casual response, there's for every one complaint about having dead bodies in the case, dead humans in the, in, in, on display, there were 10 complaints about the animals. So the, 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 the animals were much more disquieting than the human remains. So in Manchester, we covered up the, 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 the ancient Egyptian mummies as a sort of uh, reflexive process around respect and dignity. And this horrified uh, the audiences who thought, well, you know, take this off. We want to experience this human remain. And yet there was a lot of disquiet, certainly in the UK, around taxidermy displays um, about the, the death of these animals. So I had a colleague um, who uh, worked on a whale specimen. Um, and at the end of, the, of, a, of a talk, and it's, this is in uh, the chapter, he wrote, you know, a small child stood up and said, why did you kill this whale? Well, Richard didn't kill the whale, of course. He, he you know, just went and salvaged its skeleton. And there's a, there's a really interesting point for the historian there about natural history museums as his, or natural history specimens as historic sources is that these, for the most part, 99% of them, were not shot fresh. They were shot around 100 years ago, uh, for the most part. And so I think there's a lesson there for the Natural History Museum to be explicit about this, to say, look, these are historical remains. We do not go and shoot tigers and elephants today. I mean, people are still collecting other fauna. But I think that's what, in saying that medical museums are distinct from other museums, because they have humans in them and provoke a particular sort of reaction isn't to take away from the fact that a natural history museum can provoke a sympathetic and um, you know, uh, uh, upsetting or disgusting reaction as well. And from the point of view of the institution, of the direction, uh, do you think that um, the this change of museography from celebratory to more focus on the patients is, is good, um, they are open to this um, kind of I think so. I think there's uh, certainly a lot of um, recent displays have been much broader in their focus, still taking, you know, the celebrations and the firsts and the, you know, the big kit and the famous things. My worry about this is to whether this is curatorial indulgence, whether my, you know, uh, liberal worrying about celebrating um, uh, great men and, and not, not the everyday experience. I'm not sure we have ev enough evidence to suggest this is actually what audiences want. You know, people want to come and see famous, iconic things in cases. And, um, you know, it's interesting. This, I think this asthma inhaler is a wonderful example of important contemporary museology. But we know that what will bring the, I think it's something like up to two million visits to this, to the, these displays we're putting together, what's going to bring them in is the Black Knight rocket and Dolly the sheep and, you know, massive steam engines and so on and these big, famous, iconic things. So I do hope that, you know, we're not um, indulging ourselves as curators. This is a very good point, um, and uh, one that has some surprising um, outcomes, surprising uh, uh, observations with that. I think if um, sort of alternative medicines and uh, homeopathy um, and so on, um, for my part, speaking as a private individual rather than a former employee of the Royal College of Surgeons or a current employee of the National Museum of Scotland, for my part, I think it is not the duty of an organization like the Royal College of Surgeons or another professional organization to promote uh, 
models of healthcare that it doesn't subscribe to. So what was interesting in a recent, planning a recent exhibition at the Royal College of Surgeons that I didn't curate and colleagues now took forward around vaccination, we had very interesting debates about, and, and you know, in current debates around the value or otherwise of vaccination. My personal take on that was as a professional organization at the forefront of contemporary healthcare, that is to say modern Western, you know, um, um, biomedicine, the college should be explicit that vaccination has particular sorts of evidence that are valued by this body of medical health care practitioners. So I think that an organization like a, a membership organization of practitioners who subscribe to, to orthodox medical technologies, I don't think, I don't think one should shy away from it, but I don't think there's actually a duty there to represent um, different sorts of uh, healthcare solutions. I mean, not lying about anything and not covering anything up. With a public museum uh, like a national museum, I think one has to be more uh, broad. And the Science Museum in London, certainly the work they're doing to uh, redisplay their medical galleries, which are, which are huge. In Scotland, we've only got a few small displays woven through because of the nature of the collections. But the Science Museum is doing very good work in showing different sorts of healthcare regimes and different sorts of healthcare experiences. And one of the reasons they can do that is that surprisingly, Henry Wellcome was very, very broad in his collecting remit and collected items relating to all sorts of medical traditions. I mean, he's the ultimate, you know, little white pill practitioner, salesman, and yet he collected across all the things. So the legacy he left actually allows, certainly the Science Museum, who have custody of his collections, to tell really interesting and, and broad stories. For a, for a public museum, or perhaps a university museum, I think it does behoove us to present a more rounded understanding of um, what you know, a doctor might call healthcare options. You're absolutely right. Especially if you look at the patient experience. The patient experience might be a mixture of um, you know, aspirin and green tea. Not sure that would make a terrifically interest that's not a particularly interesting case study, but yeah. Thank you. Good question. More questions? Well, I, I, I would like to, to, ask, to ask you about um, two of, your, of, of the publics that you have mentioned. One, one is the, the, the medical practitioners, and the other one is, is about the contemporary artists. Um, contem um, the, medical, the medical professionals, in, in your case, I understand that in, in the Royal College of Sciences of London, uh, most of the members are proud of uh, having this kind of uh, museum. Mm, but I don't know if uh, the, the younger um, medical doctors, uh, medical practitioners, have they uh, some interest in, in this kind of uh, collections? Uh, and, and not only they as, as professionals, but also as uh, perhaps as as teachers, uh, do they use uh, the, the the museum as a as a educational tool for um, I don't know um, um, cultivating the sensibility of uh, future professionals of medicine. This is one of, of, my, of my, my questions. And the other one is about the contemporary artists. I, I would like to know more about that. In, in which way do you think a contemporary artists or, or perhaps um, curators must uh, try to establish relationships with contemporary artists in order to, to do what? To, to explain to the general public um, different uh, intellectual perspectives um, to the human body, uh, to the um, experience of a uh, disease. Um, um, are a contemporary artist one of the ways that uh, we need uh, 
to, to spread um, ideas about the disease, about the um, medicine, that in, in other way we are not able to, to, to explain uh, to, to the people. Um, well, the, the, oh, this, these questions for me are important because, uh, mm, uh, for, for instance, here in Barcelona, uh, we don't have a, a, a medical museum um, very well established, mm -hmm. very well established, and, and in, in, in a due course, um, having a, a place uh, to visit and, and so on. And one of the reasons, I think, um, you, perhaps you have. Uh, um, on this, this uh, answer or this uh, objection um, to the, the kind of collections we, we preserve mm. is, is related to um, well, uh, this, these things you, you have uh, in, in, in your collections are disgusting, this is um, rubbish, this is uh, um, um, rusty objects. Uh, that have, has, has no interest uh, at all. Um, well, um, th this kind of objections, uh, in, at, at least uh, from my, my perspective, uh, in, impedes uh, to accept uh, to, uh, to, to a, a, a different reality, more complex. Mm. Well. Uh, sure, the two very good observations. Um, the first, if we take uh, medical professionals and their pride, although we know that it is often the most um, active and involved stakeholders are senior medical profession professionals who may not be full-time in clinical practice and are spending a lot of their time working on the history of medicine, we know that a great many of the stakeholders are, are, are at that stage and very devoted and extremely knowledgeable and extremely helpful. What I was surprised by was that junior doctors and trainees were just as enthusiastic about the museum and just as professionally invested in the great developments of, of their field when they knew about the museum. So when they had the opportunity to visit, which wasn't much, you know, even the students have the curriculum chock-a-block full, or when they were aware of it, we know from membership polling they were very keen on it. Junior surgeons, even if they never visited, were very keen to be part of an organization that had this heritage. So surprisingly, they were very keen about the principle. They didn't use it for very often for teaching and practice. They used it for different um, uh, things. The prestige was most obvious at graduation day, where the, the qualifying surgeons would be visibly delighted to be part of this um, uh, you know, profession that had this heritage. So the um, younger junior surgeons were surprisingly um, in favor of the museum, broadly speaking. With contemporary artists, I've, I've had mixed feelings about this for, for some years. My, I think I have a problem with artist interventions in museums generally, science museums and medical museums in particular, when it's bad art. If it's bad art and poor science, then it shouldn't be done. And there had been none of those that I showed today, but there have been examples of, of this kind of category of so-called sci art, there have been some really poor projects that were, you know, uh, misconstrued the science and weren't very good art. If it's artistic enterprise projects, processes and outputs that would stand as quality whether or not they were involved from a medical museum, if, if they would stand alone as credible artworks, and the thing is I don't know quite how one would judge a credible artwork, but if they would stand as credible artworks, then I think there's risk, you know, there's risk of misinterpretation, there's reputational risk if you bring in controversial artists into a medical museum store, and you can see four controversial artists in a medical museum store right there, with you can't see me fluttering about in the background, worrying about reputation. 
Um, there is a risk, but in my experience, the outcome was a fresh interpretation of the collection and the my the f new interpretation and, and the the new work that I was proudest to have been involved in was were Julia Midgley's um, uh, sketches, these rapid sketches of patients working um, in their rehabilitation today. So done well, it can bring new perspectives and if I may be crude new sources of funding to reinterpret the collections and bring them to new audiences as well. So if you have a fine artist or a photographer, you take a medical uh, collection and you reinterpret it in an art gallery, yeah. which is, you know, can be done and can be done very well. There was a, I mean, my favorite was, I didn't even visit it, um, but it's still my favorite, was a, a, an exhibition called Spectacular Bodies which was, uh, a lot of it was anatomical models and remains that you and I are very familiar with in yeah. dusty storerooms. But it was brought into a fine art gallery and it was curated in a very elegant way and, and, and was, I think, extremely successful. So done well, if it's good art and they get the science and medicine right, and too often they don't, then I think it can bring new audiences and fresh interpretations to the collections. It's a rather long-winded answer that probably isn't very surprising. 